time out for Jesus. If you had a bank that credited your account each morning with $86,000, that carried over no balance from day to day, allowed you to keep no cash in your account, and every evening it emptied whatever was left in it that you failed to use during the day, what would you do? Dry out every cent every day, of course, and use it to your advantage. Well, you have a bank, and it's called time. Every morning, it credits you with 86,400 seconds. Every night, it rules off as lost. Whatever of this you fail to invest to good purpose. It carries over no balances. It allows no overdrafts. Each day, it opens a new account with you, and if you fail to use that day's deposit, the loss is yours. There is no going back. There is no drawing against tomorrow. When you hear the words, time out, what comes to mind? If you Google it, you will receive many ideas of the best attractions, restaurants, bars, and nightlife, a time out with friends. Merriam-Webster Dictionary states it is a brief suspension of activities, a break, a suspension of playing in an athletic game. You've seen this often, right? A quiet period used in the disciplinary measure of children. As the song says, what does it mean to take a time out for Jesus? On Facebook, there is a saying that will circle quite often. You will make time for matters, things that matter most. Are you spending time on things that matter the most? Have you heard of the Pareto Principle? It is commonly known as an 80-20 rule that states we spend 80% of our effort on the thing that only accounts for 20% of the results that we are after. If I said there was an 80% chance surgery would be successful, how would you feel? What if I said 20%? probably wouldn't go for it, would you? Are you spending 80% of your time and effort on the things that make up the bottom 20% of your priority list? If you have a to-do list at home, you knock off the things you don't mind doing, right? Laundry, dishes, these are most common. What about rearranging your furniture or cleaning out the pantry? At work, my least favorite thing is filing. I hate it. But eventually, I have to take an evening or a Sunday, and i got to make that the top priority because if Zenya goes looking for something, she wants to find it, so I have to get it done. The first step is finding what matters to you most and then cut out what matters the least. Psalms 39 gives us some perspective. In David's complaint God, to God, he says, You have my, made my days as hand breaths, and my age is nothing before you. He meant that to an eternal God, our time on earth is brief, and he doesn't want us to waste it. When we do, we throw away one of the most precious commodities he can give us. Each minute is an irretrievable gift, a non-redeemable slice of eternity. Sure, we have to make the telephone calls, and we have to wait at the lights, but what about the rest of our time? Are we using it to advance the cause of Christ and to enhance our relationship with him? Is our time being well spent? Did you know in 2019, people were averaging three and a half hours a day on their phones? That is a full 52 days a year, and that grew in the pandemic. We need to establish boundaries and priorities. An old illustration comes to mind, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Let's say you have a jar, some large rocks, small pebbles, and sand. Your task is to get everything in the jar, and it will all just barely fit. If you start with the sand and you try to put the larger rocks on top, what happens? It just sits there and won't fill it up. Uh, But if you put the large rocks in first, and then the small pebbles, and then the sand, the sand will fill in the cracks, and guess what? You'll even have time for water. The space is used efficiently, and think of the rocks, pebbles, and sand as the things in your life. If you start with the smallest, least important, there won't be room for the bigger, most important items. But when you start with the big things, the little things fall into place, and wherever that place may be. And if you don't, doesn't fit, you get rid of it. Once you establish what matters to you, make it a priority in your day. Schedule it first. If you're trying to focus on your health and fitness, put food preparation and walking on the calendar before you do anything else. If it's important to you to memorize Bible verses, put your phone away for every evening for one hour and give that your full and undivided attention. Whatever is most important, plan your days around it. 
don't try to squeeze it in to an already jam-packed day. But always take time out for Jesus. I found this poem online. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't take time to pray. Problems, they just tumbled around me. Heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me? I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, why, child, you didn't knock. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on, gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He answered, but you didn't seek. I woke up early this morning, and I paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. Taking time for Jesus includes waiting on the Lord. The phrase, they that wait upon the Lord, means to trust in God, to put our hope and or confidence in him. As was read in Isaiah 40, verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's take a closer look at some of the well-known people who waited on the Lord. Abraham. Abraham taught us that waiting on God can produce a deeper understanding of God's goodness and his unconditional love. He also serves as a warning for people who take matters into their own hands. Genesis 15, verse 4, Abram and Sarai tried and waited, but did not have a child. Sarai gave Hagar, the servant girl, to Abraham to help him along. Right? God needs help, right? It was a mistake. After Hagar knew she was pregnant, what did she do? She began to despise her mistress. Sarai mistreated Hagar, and she fled. But what happened? God intervenes. He sends an angel to speak with Hagar. Ishmael is born with, when Abram is how old? 86. When he was 99, 13 years later, the Lord appeared to Abram to fulfill his covenant. And we see something repeated over and over here. Then God said to Abraham, You must keep my covenant. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Was that an easy ask? No. Absolutely not. It was painful and very uncomfortable because the majority of the people, the men, were men. They weren't little babies. Here Sarai becomes Sarah and Abram becomes Abraham. I will give her my blessing. He's speaking about Sarah. You can be sure that I will give a son by her. Like God's reminding him, I told you it was going to be her, right? Not Hagar, her. Abraham fell with his face to the ground. He laughed and said to himself, Can a hundred-year-old man have a son? Can Sarah have a child at the age of ninety? Then God said, Yes, I will bless Ishmael, but your wife Sarah will have a son by you, and you will name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him. That covenant will last forever. It will be for Isaac and his family after him. By this time next year, he repeats himself again, Sarah will have a son by you. When God had finished speaking with Abraham, God left him, and Abraham did as God instructed that day. Similar to Sarah, we see another barren woman named Hannah. She is standing in a synagogue where Eli is watching. Hannah was praying so hard and with such anguish, Eli thought she was drunk. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think that I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request that you have ha asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed, and then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. She took time to go to God in prayer, and she waited, but don't miss this. Why was she no longer sad? She left believing that her prayers were already answered. Right? Amen? Hannah prays for her son. She weans him. She gives him back to God. Was that easy? No. But in chapter 2, we see Hannah's praying again. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Does that sound like she's sad? 
Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. She waited on the Lord. She was blessed. Her prayers were answered. Who can finish this sentence for me? The patience of Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and hated evil. A great beginning to the story. He has seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a very great household. We see that the children had days of feasting, and in fear that his sons were sinning, because they were partying, Job is up early in the morning, like every good parent, making sacrifices to God on their behalf. What happens next? Job 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was among them. The Lord said to Satan, whence, whence have you come? And what did the Sabbath school lesson tell us? From going to and fro on the earth, up and down within it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered Job? There is none like him on this earth. He is a perfect and upright man, one that fears God, hates evil. And Satan answers him, Does Job fear God for nothing? Has, haven't you put a hedge around him and his house and all that he owns on every side? Haven't you blessed the work of his hands? His substance is increased in the land. Two things struck me here. Satan has not touched Job up to this point. Why? There was a hedge around him, his house, and he was blessed. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? The second point is what happens next. The guard is removed. Satan can do anything to everything around him, but he can't touch Job. So his sons, his daughters, his oxen, donkeys, most of his servants, sheep, camels, were all destroyed or taken. Job replied, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Chapter 2. We see God and Satan is in conversation again, and God reminds Satan that Job is a good and faithful servant. There is no one like him on the earth. Satan says, Skin for skin. If you let me touch him, he'll curse you. Job was afflicted with sores, painful sores from head to foot. He did not curse God. Job continues to be comforted by his friends. And we arrive then at chapter 42. Now a lot has happened between chapter 2 and chapter 42, right? There's a lot of conversations and a lot of sorrow. But here's where the Lord intervenes again. And that's over and over in every book, right? The Lord's intervention. Do you see... The consequences are there, but so is God. We still have to suffer, but God is with us. Chapter 42, Job, uh, God is angry with Job's friends. I am angry with you because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. If Job prays for you, you will not die. Job's prayer saves his friends. The Lord restored, restored Job's fortunes. Actually, they were actually doubled. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part, but did Job suffer? Yes. He had insurmountable loss. Did he wait on the Lord? Yes. He stayed true. Who was the man that followed God's instructions, especially when it didn't make sense to the world? Anybody? Noah. Noah was asked to build an ark at a time when the ground was moistened. These people had never seen rain. We find it challenging to preach to people today that have access to Bibles of every language, that have access to the internet and the history. Noah preached and raised his children all while building the ark to God's specifications in the middle of the woods with no water, with no rain. He was obedient and moved forward for 120 years. The animals arrived and the door shut and they waited. It rained 40 days and 40 nights unrelenting and he waited. He had to wait then for the ground to dry up. The Bible stated that Noah did everything just as God commanded him. He waited on the Lord and his family lived. My absolute favorite Bible character is Esther, our very own Christian Cinderella story. It has all the parts, an evil plot, a king, beautiful clothes, and the good guys win. Hey, by the way, we win. The good guys win on this one too. A condensed version of the verse of Esther 4.14, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from another place. 
and who knows but that you have come to your position for such a time as this. Whenever we doubt ourselves, we had to remember this. Esther is part of a minority. After both parents are killed, Mordecai takes her home. He raises her. She is then taken from her home and brought to live in the king's harem. She quickly finds favor with the king, and a crown is placed upon her head. We read that Mordecai overhears a conversation about a plot to kill the king, and he gives that message, and the king is saved. When Mordecai learned of another plot to annihilate the Jews, he asked Esther to go before the king. Was she brave? Actually, no. She was scared. But her response was, because you can be scared and still do the right thing and have courage. Bear with me, folks. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has one law, that they will be put to death unless the king holding scepter. And that spares the life. So do you think she was scared that the king wouldn't put the scepter out? Yeah. Yeah. Thirty days have passed since the king had called for Esther. Mordecai reminds her that she too will die, because she's a Jew, if she doesn't go before the king. So continue in verse 16. Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther's response was to take three days' time out from eating and drinking. She risked her life to go in before the king unannounced, but she had a real risk of dying and her people with her if she did not. Isn't that like us today? We see the immediate risk or threat and we react to that, jeopardizing our real danger of losing eternal life. Who in the Bible accepted every risk, every way, every day of his life? Anybody? Jesus and I was thinking about Daniel. Who remembers this story? You, yes. Daniel is taken from his home. Again, I remember reading the story as a girl. You see Jan Daniel's three friends are walking in their sand walking in the sand with their hands tied behind their back. The sun is beating on their head. Then they arrive, and at some point, the king requests young men without physical defects and an aptitude for learning to train for three years and be appointed to the king's service. Part of this included eating from the king's table, which went against Daniel's belief. No doubt, everyone here has had the conversation about rabbit or pork, Right? But now we have vegans and vegetarian food around us. We probably have more options than Daniel did. His first act was to request a trial period of 10 days, a time out from eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine. If he succeeded, the reward was to continue with vegetables and water. What was the... Weird, okay. What was the reward from God? Daniel 1.15. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. To these four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. In chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the furnace where the, and were protected, and in chapter 6, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Daniel prayed morning, noon, and night. He was a creature of habit, and no decree would stop him from taking time out for God. The window opened, and he would kneel, and as someone just said, and so did Jesus, another person who would go and spend time with God. He went away from the crowds, he got into a boat, and he went to the other side. He went to the garden, and he kneeled, and he prayed. The story of Jesus is full of people who took time out for him, and he took time to spend with God. Mary, the mother of Jesus, took the time to carry birth and raise him. Mary and Martha took time out for Jesus, and they followed him. They listened, and they fed him. We think of the disciples themselves, called from their very many professions and families to follow him. Many others sought him out, people who believed and had faith. Mark 7, 
for a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. This woman was Greek. She heard of Jesus, and she knew he could cast the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs, meaning believers and unbelievers. Her response was that even the dogs eat the crumbs under the table. And she, he said, Your belief has made her whole. And she was healed immediately. Continuing in Mark, And again he came unto the Sea of Galilee, and they brought Jesus one that was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to put his hand upon him. He took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears, spit, and touched his tongue. He looked up to heaven, he sighed, and he said, Ephaphatha, or something like that, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. He charged them not to tell anyone. But what did they do? They told everybody. And everyone was astonished. He hath done all things well. He maketh the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. Reading from Steps to Christ. When our prayers seem not to be answered, we are to cling to the promise. For the time of answering will surely come. We, are, we shall receive the blessing we need most. But to claim that prayer will always be answered in the very and particular way that we desire is presumption. God is too wise to err and too good to withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. Then do not fear to trust him, even though you do not see the immediate answer to your prayers. Rely upon his promise, ask and it shall be given you, Matthew 7, 7. What did these people receive in return for waiting on the Lord? No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Healing, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Knowledge, like Daniel and his three friends, we are given a diet plan of things to eat and to stay away from. We can read and study the Bible, and we can teach others. Grace, the free and unmerited favor of God, as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. Freedom, freedom to choose, freedom from sin, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, friendship, a state of mutual trust and support, love, unconditional love. In Mark 5, they went across the lake to the region of Gerasene, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, and tore the chains apart, and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and the hills, he would cry out, he would cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Because even demons believe in him. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to be sent them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding nearby. The demons begged Jesus to go into them, and he gave them permission. And about 2,000 pigs rushed down the steep bank and drowned. Those tending the pigs were so excited and ran to the village and said, Hey, you need to come see him, right? They were scared. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who was possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were sorely afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. We see a complete opposite. A Greek woman heard of him and came fell at his feet, and then others saw, witnessed, and ran. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, begged him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away to tell how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. And that is what God is calling us for today. Go home and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. In closing, let us remember the greatest commission. 
The stone has been rolled away. An angel is telling Mary to go to the disciples and to tell them that Jesus has risen. The eleven disciples went away to Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed him. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me unto, given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. He took the time to die on the cross so all our souls wouldn't be lost. Will you give him, do you promise today, to give him one of your 86,400 seconds? Because lo, he is with us always until the end of this world. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, I pray that we are all commissioned today to go and tell what you have done for each individual one here, for each individual person that is listening online. Thank you for the words to be spoken. Thank you for your messages and your examples throughout the Bible. Thank you for being with us, no matter if it's good or bad, Lord. I pray that we will all come to you before we do anything else, at the beginning of our day, at the end of our day, and each challenge that awaits us. And remember that you are with us. We don't have to do this walk alone. Help us to go for the rest of this week, Lord. Be with those at camp and protect them. Please let every child that's leaving tomorrow know about you and your love and your unconditional love. Amen.